Welcome to this first video about the coastal system. In this video we're going to explore how the coast operates as a system and also consider how we can divide the coast into different zones. It's worth us probably starting by thinking about how we define the coast. So we can define it as is written on the screen here as a narrow zone where the land and sea overlap. And we're thinking about that transition between the sea and the land and the processes and landforms and landscapes that develop in that environment. It's really important to remember that the coast is a very dynamic environment. It is constantly changing and changing on a number of different time scales that we'll have a look at in a second. The coastline is so dynamic because it experiences influences from lots of different inputs. So atmospheric processes, terrestrial or land-based processes, marine processes, as well as human activity. So all of those different factors and inputs are combining to mean that the coastline is a very dynamic environment and one of the things that makes it so interesting as a geographer. The changes that happen within the coastal system can take place over many different time scales. If we think on the time scale of just a few hours, then something um, as simple as the changing of the tides can be a really significant change that we can see and observe along the coastline. Maybe in the case of days, we might experience changes in the weather, which could then influence um, changes to the type of waves that we're experiencing. Over the period of weeks or months, we might start to see changes in terms of um, erosion or um, transport of sediment. We might notice um, changes in the, in the profile of a beach, for example. Over years, we might start to see um, the development of landforms. So um, things like sand dunes or um, spits, we might be able to see changes and developments in those kinds of landforms. And if we think um, in terms of millennia, so thousands of years, that's when we might to start um, to see impacts from sea level change. So the coast is changing constantly and it's changing on a number of time scales from just a few hours up to um, time scales in, involving millions of years when we start to think about changes in the sea level. We can think about the coast as a system, just like we've looked at water and carbon cycles as a system. The coasts operate in a very similar way. Coasts are an open system. That means they have inputs and outputs of both energy and matter. In this case, the matter is the sediment um, that is inputted or outputted or moved around the coastline. Um, so those inputs can come from a number of different sources. We might have inputs of energy in the form of waves and wind. Tides and currents also input energy into the coastal system. We're going to have inputs of sediment, maybe um, brought into the coast from rivers um, or maybe brought along the coastline through processes um, such as longshore drift. Other factors that we need to consider um, as inputs are things like sea level change and the geology of the coastline because those two factors um, are going to influence very much um, what that landscape is like and which landforms are being created. So we can think about energy and sediment coming into the coastal system through a number of different sources. The main stores that we have within this system are our landforms. So that could be erosional landforms in the forms of cliffs or caves and arches and stacks, um, or it could be depositional landforms in the form of, of spits and beaches and sand dunes. So all of those typical landforms that we find at the coast, they are considered to be our stores. And then the outputs um, of, of sediment or energy um, can occur possibly through the dissipation of wave energy. So when a wave crashes onto a beach, that energy um, is lost from the coastal system. It's transferred um, from the sea to the land. We can also lose sediment because perhaps it might accumulate on the beach um, and then be blown inland above 
um, the tidal limit so that means that the the sea can't reach that sediment anymore um, or we can lose sediment from one part of a coastline to another so the sediment might be moved um, from one sediment cell to the next. We're going to look at sediment cells in a future video. But we can think about them almost like drainage basins of the coastline, areas um, that we can use to divide up our coastline. So that's how we can lose energy or lose sediment from the coastal system. Most of it just gets moved around within the system, but we do lose some energy and some sediment out of the system. The final part of um, any system is, are the kind of flows or transfers. Um, in this case, it's all of the processes that are operating on the coastline. So whether those are marine processes or sub-aerial processes, things like erosion, weathering, and mass movement, um, longshore drift is also um, an important transfer as well as an input of sediment. Um, and of course, deposition as well. So we will look more specifically at those processes again in a future video, but it's important to remember that those processes are moving the sediment from one store to the next or shaping um, some of those landforms which are important stores at the coastline. The other thing that systems experience is feedback, both positive and negative feedback. And you can think about some examples of these within the coastline. So if we start with negative feedback, negative feedback, remember, is a response to a change that happens in a system which brings about dynamic equilibrium. Um, negative feedback diminishes any initial changes that might take place and kind of returns a system um, back to normal, if you like, or back to that state of equilibrium. So what we could imagine um, as our starting point is that we have a beach that is in um, dynamic equilibrium. So this beach is neither growing nor shrinking. It's not really changing over long periods of time. Um, what might happen though is there might be a storm and the destructive waves from that storm might pull lots of sediment from the beach, erode it from the beach um, and deposit that material um, offshore. They might drag lots of sand and shingle from the beach and deposit it off offshore in um, a feature that we would call an offshore bar. Now what that would do is in the long term it would cause the waves to break further out to sea because they'd be hitting that offshore bar and that would make them lose some energy before they got to the beach which would perhaps make them more likely to be constructive waves. Constructive waves as we'll, again we'll see in a future video are waves which have a stronger swash than backwash and those constructive waves might push the sediment from the offshore bar back onto the beach and therefore return the beach back to that state of dynamic equilibrium. So the beach might go through a cycle of experiencing some destructive waves followed by some constructive waves which would bring it back um, to that state of equilibrium. Positive feedback on the other hand that is a feedback that has an amplifying effect. Um, so a change might occur within a system and then positive feedback will kick in and make that change more and more severe. So we could imagine um, this example here where vegetation on a sand dune is trampled on by, by tourists. So people are walking over the sand dune and they're trampling on the vegetation and they're, they're killing that vegetation. So as a result of that, the sand is gonna become exposed. Um, the sand might then be blown away by the wind. And if the sand is blown away by the wind, then the vegetation is going to struggle to regrow and hold the dunes together. What that might mean is then more sand becomes exposed, so even more is lost by the wind, and then even less vegetation can regrow. And so every time we go around that loop, we're gonna have that amplifying or positive feedback effect. So coastlines, because they are a system, do experience both positive and negative feedback. And we're gonna look at some other examples of those feedbacks as we go through the course. It's also important that we understand how we divide up the coastal zone. 
So you can see on this diagram here that we can refer to this whole section that we see on this diagram as the coastal zone, okay, from far out at sea right the way to the back of the beach. Notice that there's no um, water shown on this diagram, but what we could imagine is that um, at high tide, the water might reach up to here on the beach, and at low tide, um, the water might reach up to here on the beach. In terms of the different sections of the coastline, if we start um, out at sea and work our way inland, we can understand perhaps um, the different ways in which we, we divide the coast up into these sections. So the furthest section, furthest out at sea, um, is known as the offshore zone. Okay, In this zone, um, there will be waves, but the crucial thing is that those waves are not interacting with the seabed. So um, when we have um, a wave out at sea, if I'll just draw one down here, imagine we have some waves out in the ocean um, and we have the seabed down here, okay. The water within the wave will be moving and it tends to move in a kind of circular motion like this. And the movement gets less and less as you go down through the water, okay, until eventually there is no movement of water. In the offshore zone, the movement of that water is not touching the seabed. We can see here that we've got a bit of a gap between where the water is moving in the wave and the seabed at the bottom here. So in the offshore zone, that is what would be happening. Okay. The difference then between the offshore and the inshore is that the inshore zone includes the point where waves meet the seabed. Okay. So if, for example, our seabed started to, um, let's say, shelve in land like that, okay, um, here the waves are not touching the seabed, but here the waves would be interacting with, with the seabed. They would be hitting the bottom um, and, and touching the seabed. So that would then mark the difference between the offshore and the inshore here. The inshore zone then extends as far in as the low water mark, so the point where the low tide gets to on the beach. Okay, so when the water um, is at its lowest point, when the tide is lowest, from there as far out to sea um, as where the waves stop touching um, the seabed. Okay, that's what marks the difference between the offshore and the inshore. We then move to um, the zone called the foreshore, and that is basically um, this section here um, on our diagram. Basically the bit between the high water mark and the low water mark. So the bit between um, where the water gets to at high tide and where the water gets to at low tide. This is probably the most active part of, um, of the beach because this is washed over twice a day as the tide rises and falls and therefore is a very dynamic um, stretch of, of the coastline. We also um, have a collective term for the, for the foreshore and inshore. We call both of those collectively together. We call this the near shore. So from the point where um, the waves begin to break, so where, where they begin to touch the seabed, all the way through um, to uh, the low water mark. That's where um, we find this near shore zone. We then move to what's called the back shore. Okay, and the back shore um, is the area above the high water mark. Okay, um, as far inland really um, as any marine activity occurs. So changes perhaps only occur in this zone in during storm conditions. So the waves don't normally reach um, this backshore area because it's above the high water mark. Um, but changes can still happen here during storms and as a result of maybe wind driven activity. So when we think about the formation of sand dunes, that is occurring in that backshore zone. It's perhaps a little bit easier to identify some of these zones if we start to think about you know a particular beach that we can see here. 
Okay, so if we look at this photograph here, this is um, at the beach at West Bay, um, what we can start to identify are these two lines on the beach here. So there's one line here and there's another line here. Okay, this line represents the low water mark. Okay, so this is at low tide and we can see at that point the waves are swashing up to about this point here. This bit here is the high water mark. So at high tide, um, the waves would be reaching up as far as here. So we know from the high water mark inland, this is the back shore. That's what we can see at this point here. So from there all the way up, all the way to the back of the cliffs there, that is the back shore. Okay. Um, this bit between the high water mark and the low water mark, this is the foreshore. Okay. And then let's imagine that out here is where the waves begin to break. This bit here from the low water mark outwards would be the inshore. Okay. And the bit beyond where the waves break, this would be the offshore zone. So the waves out here would not be touching the seabed. They would start to touch the seabed here and they would break and they would swash up as far as the low water mark. That's the, that's the inshore. Then we have the foreshore between the low and high water marks. And then we have the backshore inland. And then we actually use this collective term from the high water mark all the way out to where the waves begin to break. All of this bit here, this is that zone that we call the near shore. Okay, so offshore, inshore, foreshore and backshore. The waves are not touching the seabed. The waves are touching the seabed. The bit between the high and low water mark and then the bit above the high water mark. And then the near shore is the collective term that we use for that foreshore and, and inshore, anywhere where the waves are starting to break um, and swashing up the beach. So in summary then, the coast is a very dynamic environment and it's shaped by a series of different processes. And we're going to examine those processes um, a bit in a bit more detail in future lessons. The coast is an open system because we have inputs of energy and sediment and we have outputs of energy and sediment as well. And the processes and stores um, are our transfers um, and our landforms that we find within the coastal system. Just like any system, the coast experiences both positive and negative feedbacks and we need to be able to give some examples of those. And we can divide the coastline up into distinct zones from the offshore furthest out to sea right the way through to the back shore, which is where the, the coast ends and the land begins really. And different processes are operating in each of those zones. So there's quite a lot of new terminology there, perhaps make sure that you're happy enough with the different meanings of those different coastal zones and you're able to give some examples um, of some of the inputs and processes and outputs of energy and sediment along the coastline.